Hi there. Thank you for joining. So, um, my name is Alessandro Amici. I uh, work for Bioven, a software company in Rome. We use mostly Python, and since I do uh, my hobby, most of the time involve programming and coding, uh, I often happen to do coding competitions. It's a very fun sport. Uh, I'm just an amateur. There are, um, uh, I'm not very high in the rankings. I do it as a, a weekend hobby. Uh, but I think I learned quite a lot about how the general theory of coding competitions, and it, I found it, it, it was fun, but it also helped me being a better programmer overall, even if it's not what you would expect. It's not that you know so many new tricks that you use. It's really a more general uh, attitude toward programming, and this is what I want to talk in this, in this talk. The first point is, why would you do coding competitions with Python? The, usually, you would say that if you want to compete with others, you need to have the, the, a language that is as fast as possible, which is true. And in fact, most of the competitors use uh, one of those three languages, which is C++ in, for, for typical coding competitions. This is the Google Code Jam. Uh, it's the largest single coding competition in, um, that is uh, online. And it, it's the main topic. It's the example that we use throughout the talk because it's uh, the, the cleaner and easier to track. The three most used programming languages are C++, Python, and Java, especially in the beginning, in the initial rounds. Qualification rounds, it's open to everybody. Then you need to qualify to further rounds. And then the audience becomes smaller and smaller until in the final round, only a handful of people, actually 25 or 26 of the very best competitors end up. And you see, most, even if half of the people, I mean, uh, compared to the C++ crowd, the Python crowd, it's, most, it's more or less half at the very beginning. It becomes one-tenth at the end. But still, there are people who do use Python in the finals. And the reason is that there are some of, there have been cases where the only solution that could be submitted to one of the problems was a Python. In 2011, round three, it's one of the final round, only the top 25 competitors qualify, and user Linguo, who is a proficient Python programmer, he uh, codes in nine or 10 languages in the competitions for fun, but then when things get tough, he uses Python, and he was the only one. He was ranked first because he solved uh, uh, the large input data sets of problem D with Python. No one else managed to do it, not even the very best C++ programmers. In 2013, round two, something, if you want, even more interesting happened because B. Mary, it's one of the professional, one of the guy who can win a co the competitions, and he is a C++ guy. He uses C++ almost for everything, but the last um, problem of the round two, he managed to solve. He was the only one who solved it, and he solved it in Python. So he switched in just half the time, or even less than half the time, that the other C++ competitor had. He managed to implement the Python version and to get it. Now, notice that he finished at 2 minutes, 29, and 54 seconds. It's two hours and a half is the whole competition, and he squeezed the last winning uh, submission just six seconds before the end. This is also one of the things that you learn, never give up. Finally, in the 2017, this happened last month, uh, user Kevin Sogo, who is one of the very, very younger and very best uh, in the scene, he is a Python guy, he uses mostly Python except C++ when he thinks that he really needs the speed boost, 
and he managed to finish the, it's one of the only four people who uh, submitted a correct solution for the final problem, and three of them were used Python, including Kevin Sogo. So, the point is, it is not, uh, it is, a, it might be, in certain cases, a good idea to use Python. Let's try to understand why. Also, during the time, more and more people are using Python, but in the initial rounds where, I mean, you, there are a lot of people who are not as good as in the final rounds, but also in the final rounds. It's actually, in the past two years, uh, Python actually overcame Java as a, as a language in the very final round. So the plan for the talk is to give an intro to what is exactly to compete, for example, for the Google Code Jam, then we will try to solve the problem live. They say never do live coding. Let's see. And then we try to understand from the theoretical point of view what is that really matters in a coding competition. Then. Once we have this, we can try to do a programming language comparison to understand why, what, what are the advantages and the weaknesses of every language, and then we see what we can do, what, how, what, what we have learned, that is, what if I want to do this competition for fun, and what I, can I actually get something for my day-to-day uh, -day coding, or even for life. So, Google Code Jam. That's the main entry point. Uh, it's a competition, it's run once per year. It has several on online runs and just one on-site round on a Google uh, location. It has quite sizable price, a total, size, a total of 20K of dollars. And then usually you, have, you need to solve, depending on the round, from three to five problems. They are problems with the known correct solutions. So the, the, they are... Um, uh, th there are other kinds of competitions where the complete solution or complete optimal solution is not known, but you can judge a solution if it's better than another. Here, it's an on-off. Either it's correct or it's incorrect. You can program in any programming languages because you do it on your computer. You download a sample input. You run code on your computer and you upload the, the, the output. If the output is correct, an online judge will decide if the output is correct. The competition is time boxed in a few hours. Two and a half hours is the typical length, but some are longer, some rounds are longer, some rounds are shorter. The runtime of your code, it's a few minutes. Four minutes for the uh, small input for a small data set, and eight minutes for the long data set. So every problem usually has a, a, a simple, a more si small, simpler data set and then a more complex, more broad, large data set, and you, you get different, you get independent scores if you get the, the first or the first and the second. Finally, uh, you get ranking based on the uh, problem score, that is how many pro problems you solved and how difficult they were, that you, you, are, you have given the, 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 the score in advance, and your submission time. So you need to be fast in, in submitting the solution. So you get points if you are correct and you get an advantage if you do it fast. So usually a problem is done like this. You have a problem statement that describes the universe factors, rules, parametric rules usually, and a question, what you want the, the, the what is your task? Then you have limits. This is very important. The, 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 param the parameter and the initial condition of, the, of your universe uh, uh, are described as we will not give you more than tot actor, uh, n actors uh, or so on, 10,000 or 10 or something. And there are different limits, usually for small and large inputs. This is the main difference. So typically, the problem is simpler to solve. You need less insight to solve the small input and uh, more, more steps, more insight to solve the large input. Then you have sample test cases with the solutions, so you can check if, your, uh, if, your, if the solution you've developed is actually working on a, 
on a sample data set, and then you have the real test cases, the one that you download, and if you solve them, you get points. So typically, the problem solving is you have two, two, two things to keep in mind. First, you have constraints. You have your CPU, RAM, and storage. This is what you usually think as an important thing in uh, solving a problem with a computer. And then you have the code running time. Your code can run more than four minutes or eight minutes, depending on the input. But then you have wall clock time. That is really the, 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 the big part, because you need to solve as many problems as possible in the two and a half hours that they gave you. And if you solve it faster, then you are, uh, you, you are higher in the ranking. Coding phases, we will talk quite a bit about that. those. Usually, the, the steps of this, you read the problem, you try to understand how to map the universe in some uh, algorithm and you, that, that solve the question that you are given. Then you need to implement the algorithm, actually typing it in. And then, depending on the problem, you may need performance tuning or debugging. Debugging is anything that you do after you are pretty sure you coded it well and it doesn't work. And performance tuning instead is when you realize that the solution, that the model that you have, is too slow. And then you have runtime. Runtime, it's how much time you need to download the stuff run and upload it again. Now, to give you an idea of how this looks like, we will try to do a live, uh, a live um, uh, training session. That is, we read a problem and we uh, try to code it, download it, run, upload, and see if it works. Hopefully, we will do it in time. Now, the reason uh, the, the problem that I'm proposing, I actually did live in one of the this year rounds, and I made it in seven minutes and 11 seconds. First time that I saw it. Now I saw it already, so hopefully we, it will not be long, and still was not enough to qualify. So <laughs> I, the first thousand uh, uh, competitor qualified, and I was 1,146, so tough luck. So now, the hard part that is switching this and going here. OK. So can you read the, the statement? So usually, the problem statements are uh, the universe is described in some kind of funny or interesting way, so you don't lose the, the, the fun of it. So it's about Annie is a bus driver with high stress jobs. He tried to do something, and in the end, he wants to do some horseback riding, riding for fun. So today, Annie, this is now it's describing our universe. We need to, we need to capture how to make this into a, a code. Annie is riding her horse uh, to the east along a narrow one one way road and runs west to east. She's currently at kilometer zero of the road, and the destination is at kilometer D, kilometers along the road, are numbered from west to east. There are any other horses traveling east to the same road. All of them go traveling forever, and all of them are currently between any horse and her destination, and the I horse has initial kilometer KI, and traveling at the maximum speed SI. Then he says that horses cannot overcome each other, and the question is, you can go at any, it doesn't have any maximum speed, you can go at whatever speed you want, but uh, as long as it doesn't pass any other horse. So the problem is that we have horses running on a, on a, on a segment of a line, and we cannot cross, we cannot pass them, and we want to choose to ensure smooth driving for her and the horse, and he wants to choose a single constant cruise control speed of her horse, for the entire trip, from the current position to the destination, said that her horse will not pass any other horses. What is the maximum such speed that he can choose? This is very typical. This is very simple universe. Then you have the description of the input. This is typical input. You have number of test cases, then a line with D and N, how many other horses, how long you need to go, 
and then n lines with where every word started and what is his speed. Output needs to be the string where we say what is the uh, cruise speed velocity. Limits. For the small data set, the interesting part is that we have only two, one or two other horses. In the case of the large data set, we have up to 1,000 horses. Now, you have an input, and for this input, you know what is the output. Typically, some of those, the, the, the problems are quite standard in a way that they give you the, this is my solution, my uh, scaffold solution. They, this is, I read the number of test cases, then I range on test cases, I build some kind of result, and I print the result. If I do run this right now, I just get zero because I don't do any computing. Now, this is quite simple, or at least quite simple for me. I know that since uh, uh, horses cannot overcome what I, every, every horse has a precise, has a maximum time when he arrived, he reaches the, the final destination, and somehow I want to look just for the slowest horse, that is the horse that will reach the destination uh, in the maximum time, and then I want to go there at, at the same time as him. That's easy. I mean, uh, even if you are not, if you are not, no, do not practice coding competition, you can get it done in slightly longer than seven minutes. But it's very fast to do it once you have the hang on it. So basically, what I'm saying is that first I need to read all my uh, my uh, D and N. So I get, for every test case, I get an input. Uh, I split it in D and N, uh, which is the order in which the first line is given. Uh, then I have a number of, uh, of uh, uh, horses. Uh, so I do a four and range. N, I need to read n more lines, uh, so I go input. Again, uh, these are two numbers, so I split it and I map it with int. Everything is an int. And then I need to do a list here because map returns a generator. Here you, I don't need it, but here I do. Let's see if this works. Uh, usually you do something very rough. I want just to see, okay, I, I can read it more or less. So now I have the result. Now for every horse, uh, I know I can tell at what time the horse will be in the at D, at the end of the, at my destination. So I have uh, K and S in I, and my result is the maximum of result itself, d minus k. So this is the distance that, the, the, that is remaining for the horse divided its speed. Now Python 3 is very nice, so this is already float and everything. Let's see if this works. And this says that this is the time it takes since I really don't want to have the the time, but I need to give the speed. I think I need to divide this by uh, to do the divided divide rest. Let's see if it works. And yes, so this was fast. Now, how do I know if this is correct? I need to download a uh, practice. Uh, solution. I already am in the correct uh, thing, so I replace it. Now, this is the 
I'm really testing if my, it's not on the sample test case, but on the real stuff. During the completion, this is how I get the score. I need to get the small input. Yes, very fast, so I, I save it to the small out, and now I can submit my solution, which is small out, and see, Uh, it's case one, case zero. Okay, this is a very typical mistake. Okay, now this is debugging. Sometimes you have a problem and you need to understand what is the problem and solve it. Let's see if this was the real problem. Submit. Correct. Great. Now, in this case, I already know that I can handle thousand. Uh, thousand uh, horses as well as few, so I just go and download the large case. The large uh, problem, I save it to large in. So replace. Then I do the same with large in, and I save the output in a large out, and I need to select it. Submit. Correct, great. So, this is how typically things works for very simple problem. What is interesting is that first, there was no need to, uh, yes, thank you. First, I didn't hit any of the constraints. The problem was so simple that really CPU, RAM, storage, running time was not a problem. I, in the large, in the, for the large uh, data sets, it was a couple of seconds. So the only thing that really counts in this case was wall clock time, because you get it's not a score, it's not part of the score, but uh, it is something that makes you higher in the ranking. So, if you look at more or less the, the various coding phases went, modeling was just slower to the, now because I need to read, to read the, the statement aloud, but usually it's fast, and then coding it's usually fast. If you don't have any hit, uh, performance tuning, it's not needed, in this case was not needed, and the bugging was just tried, I mean, just test the thing worker, you have a small problem, but you fix it immediately. And then runtime was zero as well. So the seven minutes, you can't submit a problem in five minutes. This is what the really good people do usually for the, the at least one or two of the problems. And everybody has a threshold where the problem is easy enough that this is your target time if you want to compete. Then there are generalized solvable problems. There is something that you are able to solve. It's not easy, straightforward art, this one, but it's something that you're able to solve. How do you recognize these kind of problems? Usually, most of the time, especially when you begin, there's, no, there's still no real need to keep the constraint because the Usually, the, the main uh, problem is to do the modeling. You can take from two minutes to 20 minutes to do the modeling that is going from the text to an actual algorithm to data structure, etc. And then coding is usually, again, not the real problem. It's the, in usually, performance tuning, you don't need. It's very, very rare, only if you do some mistake at the beginning, and in, in this is the real place where PyPy beats CPython because you need even less performance tuning. The problem is the bugging. The real key and the real reason Python has an advantage is that if something goes wrong, if you did a mistake in implementation or even a mistake in the modeling, at some, if things don't work, you need to understand where, how, and when. And this is the debugging part is where Python has a huge advantage. Oh, first, the language that you know 
most, the most is the one that has the, the advantage, but Python, if you know more than one language very well, Python has the advantage to have stack traces, very powerful print statement. Um, so debugging is where Python shines, really. And it's the largest and more risky of the coding phases, because maybe you don't need any debugging at all, even in C++, but if you do, it might grow it's easy to get one hour stuck on a, on a problem that you know you can solve, but just you made the silly mistake somewhere. So how do you recognize a simple, unsolvable problem? This depends on you, really, because there are, usually, if you keep an eye on the scoreboard, you see that the pros are, can submit correct solution to a problem uh, very fast, or I mean, that it doesn't take long. So you know that this is a simple problem in the, the, the general way, but it's not solvable for you if you don't know how to do the modeling. This is where there is really the big stuff, the, the, the big difference between experienced programmer or experienced comp competitor and uh, new, new, uh, new people. The, the other part is debugging, because if you have a complex, you might have a model that you, at the end, you might, I mean, you find what is the algorithm, data structure, that describe, but if the things are at the limit of your, of your uh, um, capacity, the time, the, most of the time, will be spent in debugging again. So, uh, this is, these are the real two key uh, assets. So the, the key assets is your time, and the two big, and the way you spend your, your time is mostly modeling and debugging. The rest is usually a fraction, or in the typical case, is a fraction. Then you have, you have generalized unsolvable problems, uh, which is some, something that is completely out of scope for you and you can easily recognize because it, the pros are having a hard time to solve it. So this doesn't care. <laughs> you, you, can, you may not care. Language comparison. So why people still use C++? And, but a lot of people are using Python. C Python and Python, I, uh, the, the, they're slightly different since we are interested in Python. I, have them separated. Now, the point is, in the modeling part, both Python and, I mean, C Python is the best because you have access to a huge number of libraries. Sometimes the solution is just to know you already know a library and you just need to code how to uh, describe the problem to a library and the, the library solves it. With PyPy, you have slightly less uh, an advantage because some of the libraries are not working and with C++ and Java usually it's harder to install stuff so unless you have a perfect setup you may not or and also interfacing with libraries is harder so it, there are many more competitors just go with the straight typed solution not going for a library. Coding the coding time in Python is excellent because it's very terse, you can be very clean, and the same, uh, it's C++, Java, it's a little bit longer, but coding, it's not really that important. I mean, it's, unless there are thousands of if, because you have a very strange problem, the coding, it's not what make, what, what make a difference. Performance tuning is that is, can, in some cases, be important, and this is the reason why the pros use C++. Performance tuning in C++, usually you don't need to do, because the C++ is fast, and it's the compiler that does most of the optimizations. Java and PyPy ha have a JIT, a just-in-time compiler, so it's fine in their kai in to use them. Python, some, C Python sometimes are very stupid optimization that you need to track, uh, and if you don't, it can be very slow. Usually, it, they are very ingrained in, the, in our brains, so it's very uh, easy to do performance optimization, like not repeating a LAN uh, or a, a function call inside the loop, but still you need to keep them in mind, so it's not so good. 
The point is that with the bagging, CPython and Python is where, and PyBytes where they have the big advantage. And as we saw, that is the big, big risk. So now we move in the, uh, what is the, what we learn about in coding competition. The first point is that strategic thinking. The, Wall clock time is the paramount asset. This is something that I, it was not clear to me at the beginning, and then you need to optimize that, manage your, your time, and be sure to know in which phase you are and if you are doing the right thing at the right phase. At a higher level of strategy, you have problem selection. Usually, you should go for the simpler problem first. This means that you go and crack and put the, the um, you put aside the, the points that you have, that you can, the, the, the lower, lower hanging fruits. And then, also, among the simple problem, usually you should consider the simple solution to the simple problem. Brute force works in a lot of cases in the first rounds of the of a code jam, and once you do did the brute force solution, you have a working solution. Then probably if to do the large, that would be not enough, but the at least you can test if your fancier solution give the same results as, as, as the brute force. Then you always need to keep focus and keep an eye on the scoreboard. That is First, you need to check what other competitors are doing, especially the pros, so that you know if something is actually solvable or not, so you don't lose time in something that is out of, too much out of scope for you. And then you really need to, to try work on problems that can make a difference for you. In one instance, I knew I, knew I, I had problem uh, doing a, a simpler problem, a, sim a simpler problem. So I set it aside and tried to do a more complex problem. When I when I solved the small for the complex for the harder problem, I saw that I didn't have a chance if I go back to the if I went back to the simple problem and solve it. That would not have been enough to qualify. So I tried to see. I gave myself 20 minutes to look at to think of the, how to solve the large of the hard problem that no one was doing. So it was really uh, an hazard, but there was no way to win otherwise. And after a while, I noticed that the, the problem was really mostly a trick, that the same solution of the small problem would have worked for the, lar for the large, even if it didn't look like. So at the very last, I just tried. I was not losing anything because I would have not qualified anyway, and it worked. So the just trying, I mean, I had an insight, but it was really, this is the only thing that I can do right now to have a chance at winning. So strategy, it's a big player in this, uh, in competitions. The other things that you learn is to focus and stress management. At every time you need to have both the round strategy and the problem strategy. That is, you are doing the, the single problem, but you need to qualify for the whole round, and this is something you need to move, go up and down in the, in the strategy level to be sure that you are employing your time the, as wisely as possible. Then something that is very important is keeping focus in a way so that you don't make mistakes while coding. Any, every mistake may cost you the bugging time. That is the worst that you can do is to do a mistake both at modeling and at coding. Usually coding mistakes are easier to track. If you do a mistake at modeling, then it's much harder to, to go back. But one of the points is everything in modeling your problem and coding should be should be kept as, as simple as possible. This is quite strange. You think that you may do fancy stuff, but no, most of the time doing the most plain uh, solution is the more easy, the, easily debuggable, and so it's the one that wins you, uh, that qualifies you. Then one thing that, this is a mistake that I do very often, you need to be ready to question all, all your assumptions. 
sometimes you decide that the solution to a certain problem, uh, to a certain problem has a greedy solution, so you go with that and you never question that assumption, which was just an assumption, and that is something that uh, you need to learn somehow again and again. Always go back and be sure that what you are doing is the, you, you didn't leave anything back. Then there is stress management. This part somehow I didn't think was so important. Uh, it said the fact that, I mean, you need to keep calm in the face of a ticking wall clock. And this is not easy. I've been competing since five years, and still when the competition starts, I can feel my heart rate going up and feeling sweaty. And so the, 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 the keeping this in control, keeping control over this, it's really one of the things that you learn, if you want, during uh, this hobby. And it's something that is very useful in all kinds of uh, situations. Again, there is the fact that you also need to keep calm in the face of the risk of public shaming, or I mean public humiliation, because the, what you submit, then it will be made public. The solutions in the Google Code Jam are public. So sometimes you know you're doing something really horrible that should be optimized, but Time is what counts, and in the end, this is what counts for you, and if then other people try to learn and download your code and see your code and say that, oh God, this is really uh, horrible, it's fine. The, still, you need to keep calm in the face of this. Then there is something quite amazing, that is the never give up. This happens with all the sports, but with uh, coding competitions, the fact that this stuff is, uh, in, in get very much closer to the way we program, and sometimes, if you like in the, the, the case that I have, if you have just one way to get out of a situation, you may try it, may not work, but you know that you did the best, and if it works, uh, you actually uh, get out of. I mean, in my case, where I qualified, and you can get out of your problem. Also, the you can imagine uh, be Mary coding like crazy. I mean, the, the final code that he submitted six seconds before the end was something like three pages full of if uh, and everything. And, uh, the, and you need to say, OK, I go on doing this even if I'm very, very tight in time. I'm almost certainly I will not have time to run it and submit it. But if you do it six seconds, before the gong, it means that you really believe that. So how do I start, or how do I get better at competition? You get this advice online. The most important thing is practice. The second most important thing is practice again, and so is the third. There's nothing like uh, that that is more important than practice. But now, for real, so something useful. First, practice. You need to practice real-world competition from start to end with a timer. The wall clock, the fact that you feel pressure and keep the stress and focus needs to be real even in competition. Then you need to go for volume first. Do a lot of simple problems. Even if they are obviously simple, you need to get your uh, muscles, coding muscles going. Then you go to problems that are more to, the, to your limits. You need to understand and try to figure out what are the problems that, what are, that are your limit and try to go for that. Then learn from code of other competitors, of other competitors, and then learn libraries. There are a lot of libraries. These are the ones that I find most amazing in, uh, in coding competitions, but a lot of libraries just make a lot of things much simpler. Then you need to learn data structure and algorithms. This is the a course that I followed, which is amazing, and I invite everybody to use it. So, what do I learn from everyday programming? Basically, the point is modeling, coding, performance tuning, and debugging is the same. And the point is that performance tuning and debugging have a much lower time scale. So, this is where you need to optimize your wall clock management time. Also, strategic thinking. 
always try to get the, the, to the low-hanging fruits before doing the big architecture, and always keep an eye on the scoreboard. That is what is exactly that is useful now, and what is the most useful thing that I can do now. Finally, focus and stress management is the thing that I really like the most. That is, if you have a bug in production, or you're doing a hackathon, you have time boxed, you want to solve something as soon as possible, and all the keep calm in the face of the clock and keep calm in the face of people looking at you, like in client facing problem solving situations. This is something that once you know, once you do coding competitions, looks much, much simpler to do. Job interviews as well. I mean, you have someone looking and watching every case stroke. Or, you, or you have, if you're trapped in a fire, you need to say, okay, keep calm, I need to solve the problem, not to panic. Then again, strategic thinking uh, it works exactly the same also in your life, uh, and keep an eye on the scoreboard, uh, it's, all, it's as well one of the most important things. So I thank you for your attention, and I'm ready to get questions if you want. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. I have a very quick question. It could be a bit specific. I'm, uh, can you hear me good? Uh, I hear very badly. Can you speak yeah, can closer hear to the microphone? Uh, is it better? Yeah, better. Okay. So it, this could be a bit specific. I am like the Python newbie. I mostly use like the CC++. I was curious why uh, Python is better for debugging. Like the, what are the uh, advantages over the uh, okay. C++? The first and most important point is stack traces. This is where Python shines. Stack traces are usually very, very uh, useful, and you get them for free immediately. And the other point is that the print statement, which is really the only debugging tool that you use in coding competition, it's much, much powerful. So you get a very nice representation of a lot of the data types, especially if you use standard data types, which is what you do most of the time. And um, in case you are forced to go into the debugger, which you really want to avoid, uh, you just do import IPDB, IPDB set trace, and the, the introspection of Python helps you really a lot. I did not much uh, C++ in my life, so there are, I'm probably not an expert in debugging, but uh, when I did when I needed to port uh, uh, my Python libraries to C++ for performance reason, even if I already knew what I wanted to do, it was a pain that every small details needed much more time to be debugged. Okay, thank you for your talk. And I wanted to ask because you said that we have the time limit for execution also. It was like four minutes for the small data set. And how is this measured? Because you are downloading the input and uploading the output. So how to do it? You, you have a timer. When you download the, the data set, you have a timer, and you can only upload the result in, within four minutes. If you go out of, uh, um, after, you, you cannot, you're not able to upload the data, the, the, the solution. OK, so basically, if you have more power of your computer, then you have kind of a lot of advantage. Yes, and quite, surprise, quite surprisingly, this doesn't count uh, most of the time. In my whole career, I mean, I, I, I did a lot of practice and a few code jams, five probably, and I think only once I really had something like a solution that ran in five minutes instead of four. And it was something like a trivial mistake that I made. Uh, so. Yes, it may happen that a faster computer or a faster language is a different, but it's quite rare. All right, I think we've probably got time for one more question, if anybody. No. All right, okay, please join me in giving Alessandro a hand. Thank you very much.
And uh, please remember you.